you Supreme Council or Most High? What's gonna, the title? I'm, I'm going to leave it up to you. You're going to leave it up to me. So I'm a massive fan of Joseph Jurassi. Uh He's the, you started off as headmaster and then it became everything else. Yes. And the first time I went to a uh, school function where Joseph Jurassi, as the principal, was giving his speech, he said, no, no, he said, when I first started teaching, they called me Jurassic Park behind my back because I was so strict. And that's not at all who you are now. So he's open-minded and um, a real inspiration for me as a parent. I've got two children at the school. I've got a teenager in the trick and another teenager who knows everything in grade 10, who hopefully is watching grade nine. <laughs> um, and the reason we're here tonight is to talk about things that are perhaps coming up for you in the home. And it was born of a conversation about crises that we feel are happening as parents, but also in the country. Right now, the future of education is high on the agenda. We've had nearly two years of COVID. Online schooling has been available and a privilege for some and not for others. Some people have fallen tremendously behind and others have been okay. But what we're looking at is what happens to the future of education in this country and do we stay or do we go? And if we do stay, how do we educate our children? What choices do we make for them within the realms of education as it is in South Africa? So, Joseph, you're the only person to talk to about this. I'm ruthlessly biased. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> and I think, I actually, in my practice, I see clients who don't realise, as parents, what they are putting on their children when they say, everything is terrible here, we have to lose the country. Because everything is not terrible here. And what we forget is that our children... For us, we have so much world, and our kids' education is one piece of it. But for our children, school is the world. Yeah. So when we say everything is awful, this country's going to the dogs, we're leaving, we're saying your world is over. And we don't give them any options or thoughts of how it could be different, better, more. And we're not raising problem solvers then, we're running away. Mm. That's what we're teaching them. So from your perspective, if you had to give a, a sort of a broad overview as to the immigration issue itself and what we're telling our parents and what we're telling our kids, what's your broad view of it? So, Sam, I think, first of all, immigration is a very personal thing, right? And, and I think in South Africa today, for various reasons, um, there are, are many parents who are considering whether they're going to be staying in South Africa or not. The impact, and sometimes I don't think parents realize it because mom and dad feel all the pressure is on them and the stress is on them. But as they talk about these issues, the reality is that that stress filters down yeah. to the children, right? Uh, and it doesn't matter what age you are, whether you're a, you know, a young kid, even on little things like I'm going to be leading my friends, right? Those are huge things because at school, your, your relationships and, the, and friends that you're building are very important to you at that particular time. So even as an adult, leaving family and friends is important, but for children, it's even more important because specifically when they become teenagers, I think their friends are even more important than their parents, right? Those yeah. relationships are really... So the first thing is, not only am I leaving South Africa, which yeah. all right, I can leave, but I'm leaving my support system, my friends, and how am I going to cope? And I think that one of the things that I would suggest that you know, when parents are making this decision, is to empower their children to feel that they have a say in this, right? At the end of the day, obviously, parents make the final decision, but allowing children to know that, you know, asking them their opinion, um, when, when are we going to make this move? How do you feel about this move? I think there's a lot of preparation that has to take place. Um, and it's, it's not even moving overseas, it's emigrating. I mean, we're seeing more people yeah. moving to the coast, moving to Cape Town, moving to Durban. But for a child, it doesn't matter, even if you're moving out of the neighborhood, right? It is a big movement. And moving out of their school, I mean, I've had parents not moving because they don't want to leave Red Hill, right? Because of, of, of the close relationships and the bonds that are formed. So they, these are very important things to, to discuss. It's personal. Uh, parents make decisions for various reasons. The language you use is really important. I mean, I think what you said is really important. Mm -hmm. We don't have to say the entire world or the whole yeah. of South Africa is terrible mm -hmm. and that's why we're leaving. Let's rather look at other reasons why we might be leaving. Dad's it got might, a great job opportunity. Absolutely. Um, you know, so for, for various reasons, we could be leaving and we could be leaving in three years' time. So let's not make it seem like the entire world is coming to an end Need now um, and rather allow our, our, our kids to, to kind of 
build the confidence to deal with the situation as it is now, but empower them that they feel they have some say in how they're moving, when they're moving. Allow them to open up and share their anxiety. Just being able to do that to a child is so important for them to be able to say, this is how I'm feeling. And then really important to me is acknowledge that feeling. And what you say there's so important because the amount of times we'll hear we moved, exactly, so immigrating, or we moved overseas and her schoolwork went off the rails. And we blame the education system that we've gone to, but actually in that fear and that confounded sort of spirit of confusion, what do you do? You're there scrabbling. And I think it, what you've said there is very important to at least allow a semblance of conversation, information. This is what we could do there. This is the kind of thing we could do. Yes. Now, for some people, immigration isn't on the cards at all, but the fear about education is still big. Sure. Where's it going? What's happening? What kind of, of, of education should I be giving my child? Sure. So this is a huge question. Mm -hmm. One, something that keeps me up at night, and I've written about some of these things, is where education is going. And, you know, I've, I've been very pleased that some articles have said, you know, that although I'm in private education, um, I am worried about education in South Africa because there are only, let, let's give an example, there are 5,000 odd children that will graduate from IEB or private schools, but there's 700,000 children that will be leaving school. And the 5,000 children in the private school system are not going to make or break South Africa. The 700,000 are. So what are we going to do about that? So I'm, I'm going to be talking from, you know, I mean, we've probably got an audience of, 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 of parents who've got their kids in government schools as well as in private schools. So I'll, I'll try and deal with, 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 both, with both of them. The more the better. Yeah. So your question was? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to not take offense at that. <laughs> so my question is, what do we tell parents yes. about the best way of educating their children? Because when I was a little girl, you went to school and you did what the school said, and then you went to university, and those were your choices. Sure. And if you didn't go to university, you went to secretarial school, and everyone looked down on you, because yeah. university was the only way. Sure. And all you had to do was get a decent matric. Sure. Now it's it's very different. Very, and there's very a lot different. more, but there's also a lot more options. Oh, there's so, there are a lot of options, and that leads us into parents helping their children look at those different options. And you know, South Africa is in itself a very exciting place because not everybody has to go to university to become a doctor or a lawyer. The opportunities in a country like South Africa, if you have an entrepreneurial spirit mm -hmm. and you're at a school that develops that, and so I think also for parents to look at schools that do develop entrepreneurial spirit. I think the future for South Africa are entrepreneurs. Mm. It's people who can go out there and actually make it and, and, and create jobs and create businesses. We're not, we're not going to survive this on you know, the businesses that are out there that are going to be employing people. So that, that's really important. My fear, let me start, say at the beginning though, I think the South African education system, and I'm sorry to break it up, but let's just take private schools mm. at the moment, is world class. At this moment in time, if you have a private education or if you go to a, a well-functioning, and I'm sorry mm -hmm. to say that, but I think a lot of our schools are not functioning in the government system. Mm -hmm. But if you do go to one of the schools that, you know, they are functioning well, that education will really set you up no matter where you go in the world. I've been to many schools and I've sometimes sat back and thought, yeah, no, no, we're doing that. No, that's fine. So we are doing some really good things that will set our kids up. And I think the overseas universities know that. Mm -hmm. And that's why many of our students will get into overseas universities. My fear, though, is specifically with COVID, mm -hmm. is that government is continuously dumbing down education. And, you know, something I was really worried about, I mean, you, you, you would have read that I, I suggested moving more in line with the A-levels or, you know, the, the GCSEs where you need a minimum of five subjects to get into to university in order to make back all this lost time with COVID. But I'm reading government is saying, well, we'll just pull more content knowledge out of the curriculum. Now, that, that I'm really scared about that mm. because there's only so much you can take out of the curriculum before students get to university and well, maybe we'll, you know, and, and don't have the, the knowledge Grounding. to go into mm. a lot of the other professions that we need. So I am worried about that. So, so the advantage, if you can afford it, if you, you know, if you have the means, is definitely to look at the possibility of some type of international exam. 
right? Now, those are run by South Africans mm -hmm. who are being trained up in, 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 in being able to teach those international exams. And I think we're going to see more and more of that happening in South Africa because there your content is not being taken away. You, you're competing on a world, on a global and international level. Mm -hmm. And so what our students are having to learn is the content that is making you um, globally competitive. As opposed to taking eight subjects or seven subjects and only learning a little of each. Well, that's my problem. Is that push us down. We're saying we need, and nobody's giving us a mm. really good reason why our, our students have to take seven subjects, right? Specifically in the situation we're in South Africa. Now, yes, some, some schools can offer seven and eight, but I'm talking about a minimum of five. But I can't change the education system. Not yet. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, I think in terms of the IEB, mm -hmm. if you're not going to be doing an international exam, the IEB, you know, has, has really good credentials. And there's some amazing people that are working in the IEB and doing the best that they can to keep the standards at a high level, specifically in that they are offering AP subjects, right? So advanced programs. So this is interesting because one of the questions that came through was, from a lady who says, I'm a bit confused between our post-metric, A-levels, AP subjects, and international baccalaureate, which one is better than the others? Mm. And I must be honest, I looked at AP subjects and A-levels and post-metric and thought, well, I vaguely know what the difference is. Sure. But if I vaguely know what the difference is, and most of that is offered, what's that for people who haven't got a clue? Okay. So the first way to start is, if you are at a school that offers mm. advanced programming maths, advanced programming English and now advanced programming physics, mm -hmm. right? You have the opportunity to be taking it at a much higher level, right? My suggestion is not to go and try and take every single one of those because it, it does become overwhelming, but to kind of look at what degree you're going to be going into. So if you're going to be going into a, a degree that needs mathematics, then consider doing AP mathematics. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't end up getting a distinction at it, you know that you are going to be getting a deeper level of mathematics and a deeper level of understanding, which is prepping you for university. And even though the universities at the moment can't really accept AP subjects, because unfortunately at this moment in time, not all schools have the, sure. the resources to do AP subjects, I'm not worried about what is on your certificate, right? I'm worried that when you get to university, you have the necessary skills to be able to do well in whatever you, you're, you've chosen to do. So that even if the AP specifically isn't recognized officially, at least you'll be able to get into that subject and not start from the perspective that you need to do a bridging program. Because the university of, on its own is such a jump from sure. school, it really is. And then to have to add into that huge jump, and it's a mindset shift as well, to add in, um, we used to call them step programs. Yes. To add that in as well. It's, it's a lot of pressure for first time. Absolutely. So, so, so take one of the ones that if you're going to be going into engineering, you know, you possibly want to look at the physics. Mm -hmm. And the IEB are going to be offering more and more AP. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's my opinion. Because I think that allows them to remain, um, you know, globally competitive. And, and that's why they're doing it. Um, so look at what course you're wanting to go into. Choose one of those. Mm -hmm. And that will allow you to be able to go into first year English or first year mathematics with, with the extra skills that you, you, you need. But there is a caveat to that. Right. Students can't take it and then drop off, right? Okay. And a lot of our South African students don't have that grit, right? If it doesn't come easy, I'll just drop it. So this is actually where parents come in. Absolutely. It's for a child to say, I need to do this because I want to do that. And for a parent to be supportive of that and, and help with the structure of that. Because a child can't take an AP subject and, you know, mom, dad goes, well, away you go. Sure. There's got to be, um, and that's why I think it's so important to constantly be talking about your child's subject choice and education throughout the entire process so that you're always yeah. on the same page with what's happening next. So that's where I want to say subject selection mm -hmm. for me Apparently. is the most important that will lead you to success. Mm -hmm. Right. Take the wrong subjects. Don't listen to the school. Don't engage and engage and, and engage with, you know, the headmaster or the head of student well-being or the head of academics and push your point. Also, look at the system from grade 10 to 11 to 12 to see where can I and I often say, you know, it's like you, you, you almost need to have something on the side. Right. If I go in this direction, will I be able to change? Yeah. Will I be able to move in here if it's not working for me? And sit down and work out that plan in grade 10. You know, you want to have an insurance policy, right? 
okay, how long can I carry on with science before it becomes too late to move yeah. to another subject? Sit and, and take in the advice that is given to you. For instance, I would say if you really are wanting to go into a course that requires mathematics, don't also take an additional subject. You don't need business studies. Concentrate on the AP mathematics and don't take an additional subject in terms of, say, business studies. Take the required subjects that you need, seven, yeah. and just AP Maths or just AP English. Some parents want their children to end up with 11 subjects. Yeah. Let me say to you, that is a sure way of not achieving full success, right? So really, you need to take the advice of, 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 of the people that you're talking to, and you need to be at a school where you trust the advice that you're getting. Ask as many questions as you want. Go in there and have that interview. The school, you know, it, it, they, they have to spend the time with you because these are very important discussions to have. I think you make a good point. Maybe that is another topic, actually. Absolutely. A subject choice because it doesn't matter what your financial situation is, there will always be someone at the school you can talk to. Absolutely. And if it's if, if somebody's not listening, bang harder. Knock harder, right? Because that's that's what our job is. So I want to get to IB, but before I do that, I want to ask you about A levels and choice sure. metric. Sure. Because the generally accepted belief used to be that if you wanted to study overseas, you just had to do a post metric or an A level. Right. Is that still true? Okay, so there's various ways of getting overseas, right? Again, the IEB is a way of getting overseas. Uh, getting overseas. Um, five years ago, uh, just to mention a university that came to see me, St. Andrews, mm -hmm. I said to them, okay, what do our children need to be able to go to, you know, to go to St. Andrews? Um, it's in Scotland, uh, one of the top universities in the UK. They said, we'll take any student that gets five distinctions or more. So many of our students can achieve that, right? Obviously, it depends on what course you're going to go into. It's not just any five distinctions. Mm. If you're going into the sciences, we have to look at science. You've got to look at maths. But at this moment in time, a very good IB um, metric will get you into universities. Will it get you into some of the IB League universities necessarily? It's more difficult. The reason for that is the overseas universities don't really understand the IEB, mm. right? Um, they, but they do understand A-levels and they do understand the baccalaureate. So they can then look at you, your child, and they can benchmark with all other children who are writing an international exam. If you're a top IB student yeah. or a top A-level student, your chances of getting into Cambridge or Oxford are, are much better. But you've got to be a top IB or a top um, you know, uh, A-level student. Uh, it's no good just being, you know, getting a, a basic because that's not going to get you in. You might be better off doing an IEB and getting the five distinctions, mm -hmm. right? So, so you've got to do that. Parents need to do a lot of homework on these, uh, the, you know, these co different courses. A levels, um, it, it's recognised around the world, but specifically in the UK. Okay. Right, because it kind of follows their GCSEs and then they go on to the A levels. And there again, you do your GCSEs, you do a minimum of five subjects, and your A levels is a minimum of three subjects. Mm -hmm. So you can see, even in that system, they're wanting to go deeper into, into material and not ask kids to do a whole lot of subjects um, that is just a broad range of superficially understanding the subjects, but rather you're about to, because A levels is really looking to go to university. Right. That's what it's what it's meant to be. It's not it's not to go into any of any other kind of you know, location. Um, it's more um, it's more specific. It's going to be looking for you to do, you know, if you're going to do the sciences because you've only got three subjects, you'll be looking at doing physics, chemistry and mathematics. Yes. Right. Um, the IB is looking at a more broad education. So let's unpack that a little bit, because when it first came, when you first announced it three years, four years ago, five yes. years ago, four years ago. The IB, yeah. It was quite exciting, I think, for a lot of parents, but also quite intimidating. Sure. Because there's the feeling that if that if you don't do IB, you're in some way stopping your child from getting these overseas opportunities. Sure. But that if you do do IB and the child's flagging, they've lost their place at IEB. So it's a it's 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 kind of is it is it that clear cut? So in, in terms of the different courses? In terms of what each one takes away from the other or adds to the other. Right. So, you know, so so, so at Red Hill, we do a pre-IB course, okay. right? So do you want to talk through that for people who don't know what sure. that is? So the pre-IB course really allows students in grade 10 to have a taste of what the IB is about, right? The content that you are using is the IEB content, okay. right? 
but you might be forced to do AP subjects. So okay. IB AP subjects, mm -hmm. right? When we get to the mid-year exams, we then have interviews with parents. And I'll, I'll give you an example. So I was interviewing a particular parent um, and I looked at their results and I said, right, you know, why, what, what do you want to be when you grow up? And the student said, I want to be a doctor. And I said, well, you're not going to be a doctor on these results. What's your second option? Mm -hmm. And the student said, well, I'd probably then do a BSc. And I said, well, which overseas university would you like to go to? And they said, well, I'm not really keen on going to an overseas university. I, I'd like to go maybe to UCT. And I said, go do the IEB. Okay. Why? Because in the IB, you're going to have to do physics and chemistry okay. at a university level. Whereas if you go to the IEB, you're doing a general physics course. You're doing a general physical science mm -hmm. course. Your chances of getting a C or so there is much greater than getting a, a six or a seven in both chemistry and physics, and you'll be able to get in easier to UCT on that, that. And they also understand the IEB better. And that's where the conversations are so important. Mm -hmm. So at Red Hill, we've just hired someone as a guidance counselor. Her full-time job is just to work with students because we know how important that is in making these life changing decisions. So it really is important. It's it's different courses for different horses, mm -hmm. right? So what's interesting for me, and I just want to stop you there, is how many times those conversations don't happen generally, and then you're left with kids who are doing IB to impress their parents yes. or not doing IB in case they let their parents down. Yeah. So how, as an educator, do you have those conversations? So I'm, there'll be parents watching this now yeah. going, I don't know what to tell my child. I don't yeah. want to push it too hard, yeah. but I don't want to hold it back. Right. So at a school like Red Hill, we would say, if you're even considering do it, do the pre-IB. Okay. It's going to give you an idea of what the pre-IB is all about. Um, when we get to mid-year, I interview together with uh, staff that are either our IB coordinator, I had a student well-being, to discuss their mid-year results, we do a, and I never have that discussion without the child being present. So both parents, I'd like to be at those meetings together with the child. And it's actually been amazing how we managed to talk through where the child should be. Because in the discussion, you can see who's the dominant force, who's wanting to do the IB or not the IB, yeah. who's doing the pushing, and then you know who to concentrate your conversation on who you need to be able to convince. Right. <laughs> and, and I would hope that our parents know that it really doesn't bother me whether you do the IB or the IB, right? I want what's best for your child. And that really is important. Um, moving away, I mean, the IEB means you have to do a science. Yeah. So again, if you're not a child who's strong at sciences, you're, you're at a bit of a disadvantage. And the I and the IB also doesn't allow you to do like a math literacy course. You have to do higher level mathematics. What I would have given for math literacy when I was in the trick, <laughs> oh my word. And you know, math literacy has a huge place because there are certain students, I mean, I was talking to a student the other day who wants to go into law and just said, I, I don't know, I don't know why I struggle with maths my whole life because I actually don't need it. No. So getting an A in math literacy would have got me in much easier. But more importantly, my stress levels would have been so diminished over the last two years. Um, but a lot of the time we build up these things in our mind that without math and science, we're closing all the doors. I mean, you know, we're not, we're not keeping those doors open, not understanding mm -hmm. that if you do badly at math and science, you've actually closed all doors. All the doors. Yeah. Because then you can't even get into a BA. Yeah. Because you might not get a, um, a, a bachelor pass to get you into university. And ultimately it's about the points. No one ever asks you later what they're for, unless it's a specific degree, as you say, like a medicine. Yes science degree. Right. So the A levels allowed you to be more specific, right? And it's also more kind of uh, uh, university dominant. It, it's a lot about information and people who do the A levels will kill me for this. We just felt <laughs> it was a little bit more regurgitation. The IB has a whole philosophy around it. So you've got to do subjects like TOK, which is the theory of knowledge. Okay. You actually have to understand how the brain works. How do we acquire knowledge? You've got to do research projects. But most importantly, you've got to do a subject called CAS, which says you've got to actually do an activity. Yeah. So you've got to do a sport or dance or, or something like that. You have to do something artistic, right? And you have to do community service. 
So it, it's built into the international baccalaureate yeah. that you've got to be an all-round yeah. individual. Now, some kids just are not into that, right? So they might just look at doing a, something like the A-levels um, or just the, I, you know, the IEB. Each one, as I said, it's, you, you've got to go into it in depth. You've got to go to different schools who offer. If you're really interested, mm -hmm. and do your homework, and then try and meet with the you know the counselors that they have on their schools mm -hmm. to get a better idea. This should start from grade eight. So this is interesting because it brings me on to my next question. Say you're planning on immigrating as a parent, and maybe it's because there's a great job or there's family overseas, and you know you're looking at a two, three, four year process. Yes. Do you see that in Red Hill? And if so, how do you talk a parent through? those choices going forward mm. so somebody comes to you and says my daughter's in grade nine we're probably moving to the uk in a few years time it's not cast in stone but we're looking that way what's the best route for her to take how do you deal with something like that so i wish parents would give me that, that information <laughs> earlier right um often we kind of get it with two months notice oh wow okay. right and so we end up then more, more or less arguing about whether they have to pay a terms notice or not right instead of actually yeah. two years in advance knowing that you're leaving mm -hmm. that gets rid of the terms notice because we can understand we, you know, two years we, just... we, exactly we know <laughs> yeah. where you're going yeah. but it does allow us to start prepping your child mm -hmm. for instance we can ask the right questions at this moment in time which country are you going to mm -hmm. what are the universities they're looking at would they favor an ib as opposed to an a level mm -hmm. what would be better for your child to take what subjects, which universities. We can lead them into, you know, where they should be looking. Um, you know, we can put them in touch with our careers counsellor to look at different universities. It gives us the space and the time. And also why I say, you know, in, in, in grade eight it's important because grade eight you're looking towards grade nine and your subject choices. It doesn't actually start at the end of grade nine going into grade ten. It starts a lot earlier than that. And at Red Hill, we are starting to look at actually allowing our students to take less subjects in grade nine. Mm. Still within one of the humanities, one of the sciences, et cetera, but taking away some of that pressure, but we've got to start those conversations. So each really level, we get rid of some subjects as we move all the way through until you get finally to matric. You know what course you want to be in, you know what subjects you want to do. Now, a lot of parents listen to us. And I, I had a student, I'll just give you an example of a student who was doing maths and science, but badly, really badly. I knew that the student was really not interested, it was not going to go into any of the sciences. Cut a long story short, we managed to convince the child to move to maths literacy and to do drama because I knew that the child loved drama. You cannot believe how this child has grown in confidence, because once you start doing well at subjects you love, yeah. all of your other subjects start to improve, right? Whereas if you keep getting a bad mark in science or mathematics, you just feel you're not worth anything. And that gives students the motivation to do better as they start to get better. And here was a child who was never going to go into the mm -hmm. sciences, but was going to go either into a BA um, or to something artistic. Um, so those conversations are really important. So I think what we're talking about the whole time is conversations, yeah. being open with your child, being open with the school, understanding immigrating, you know, is not is not a crime. Um, not you can true. tell people about Freedom it. You can choice. you can let them know that, you know, this is where we're going for whatever reasons. And I know as South Africans, often we either kind of say, well, we're going because this place is so terrible and I can't wait to get out of here and everybody should be getting out of here. Or we get really embarrassed about it and we don't want to tell because then we're being unpatriotic, yeah. etc. It's like, you know, when people ask me, well, if you do the IB, are you getting people ready to immigrate? Is it a passport to immigration? Well, this was what I was going to ask you is what does it qualify you for? And how does that become something the child wants as opposed to their parents? Absolutely. So, the, you know, let, let me deal first with, you know, the IB is a passport to, um, to being globally competitive right? So that I can go anywhere that I want, mm. right? So an example is I, I, after many years of being in a very comfortable position at my last school, right? I chose to go to Australia, right? I had a horrible time there, but it allowed me to become globally competitive right? because I went to a school and a country in terms of its international standards mm. of education taught me so much, right? I never went with the intention of immigrating, but I went with learning more. And then I came back. 
and hopefully my experience overseas has allowed me to be a better principal and run a better school. What I would like students to do who are intending to go overseas, going overseas doesn't mean I'm going there to live. Sure. It means I'm going to Edinburgh to have four years, wonderful years in a different culture. I'm going to learn a whole lot and hopefully come back mm. and give back to the country that I live in. And if you don't, you don't. Then you go overseas and you, you carry on with your life. Our school is not about saying where you should live in your life and what you should do. It's about giving you the tools, the skills that will allow you to go overseas and come back, to go overseas and do what you need to do there. I want children to be able to decide, to have the ability to decide that in Hong Kong, there is the best university there when it comes to IT or whatever I want to do in IT. Go there, right? Because that's giving you the best opportunity. And then from Hong Kong, I don't know, go to America, come back to South Africa, do what you need to do. But you can always look back to your school and say, yeah. that was where I started. They gave me the advice. They gave me the skills. Because that's what we really are about. And I think when you launch the International Baccalaureate, that first thought of, oh, my goodness, we have to be immigrating for our child to have that, or they have to want to study to be a doctor at Edinburgh. They need to have it for that. Sure. And there was less kind of concentration from a parent perspective on what it actually meant holistically for the child. And I think when you are in a situation with these fewer subjects, but there's so much more depth to them, it allows you to grow as a person. So even at the end when you say, well, I actually want to stay in South Africa or mom, I'm happy to go and try this somewhere else. But we had the first year of the IB students who started mm -hmm. that first one. What were their results like? And what did you learn from that process? Okay, so our results, you know, in, 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 any, in any course that you do, you have the bell curve, yeah. right? So internationally, they have the same type of thing, right? And unless you're going to only allow your top, top, top students to do the IB, you're going to get a range of results. And we got that range of results. Um, you know, we got Wangari Mbutia, who was placed in the top 2% in the world internationally, right? So... She is a very bright student, mm -hmm. right? But we must have had something to do with it. Right? <laughs> Our teachers so, must have played a role. Whenever people guy. say your kids are amazing, I go, I'm <laughs> going to take that because if they were terrible, it'd be my fault. Right. We were the parents. Um, you know, so she's now studying overseas at, I think it's Penn State. In fact, she, she did a project while she was at school, which she did online, and she's just now been um, selected as, she's the winner of her region, which wow. is the African region. Yeah. She's in the top 15 students internationally now. Um, you know, so, so we had students that did brilliantly, and we had students that did very, very mediocre, mm -hmm. right? They, 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 didn't, they didn't kind of, you know, knock the, the lights out, okay? But every one of them got into, uni th those who wanted to, got into university. One or two took a gap year. Many didn't go overseas. They went to South African universities and they got into South African universities because part of what we do at Red Hill as well is with our IB coordinator and our career counselor, we're on those phones all the time. We need the South African system to understand the IB. We need them to understand, you know, that the IB is a really good course. And we push for our kids to get into as to the different universities. So this is interesting that you're saying this because one of the questions that's come through here is if my child does the IB, and doesn't want to go overseas, will they get a place at a South African university? Are there still places for children who haven't done IEB or GED? Absolutely. GED. So all of our students okay. are who wanted to go to university yeah. are in universities. What was really interesting, though, one of the things that we offer our students, right, is that those students who were not happy with one or two results, mm -hmm. we allow them to be online with our teachers free of charge Fantastic. from January to May to when the May exams are. Right. So uh, quite a few of our students decided we weren't happy with our maths result, we weren't happy with our science result. But now that the rest of our subjects are out of the way, we only want to rewrite maths or physics. I think we had about five or six. All of them, in whatever subject they wrote, went up by one or two marks. Now, one or two marks doesn't sound a lot, but there's only seven levels. Yeah. So if you go from a five to a six, you've gone up quite a lot. right? Um, and many of them went up by two levels. So they were ecstatic with those results. Yeah. And because the universities overseas only start in September, they have that opportunity to get, to get better results. And then they get those new certificates and all of a sudden their results go up. 
but all of our students did well all of them are at universities we're very happy with that we've looked at our results this year we've made certain tweaks certain changes our results are looking really good for this year um, we do have a bigger group but most excitingly is our pre-ib for next year has grown from the year before where there were 22 students mm -hmm. to 40 students wow so it is showing many students are wanting to under, to have this experience and then make that decision, you know, when they get into grade 11. So that's a lot of learnings. Hmm. A lot of people that are doing the, the, the IB. I mean, a lot of learnings from what you did. There's a lot of Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And now, yes, a lot of learners who want to do it as well. Absolutely. We, we are learning all the time. But, we, you know, often people say, but radio, you don't stop changing things, right? That's Not because every year, every year we learn something different. Today I was sitting, you know, with my faculty heads, and we were just trying to figure out how do we relieve stress on our matrix? Because we've learned that as, you know, places become more competitive, students are stressing more and more. I mean, one of the ideas, with, you know, for instance, can we just have every month a week where there are no assessments? Just, can we just breathe? Can we just have a week where I don't have to hand anything in? I can just catch up on what I've missed out on the last. So I don't know, will I change it next year? Right, well, that will have be discussions. Mm -hmm. But any school, I believe, that runs the same program year in and year out is not re-examining what they are, what they what they did, and are not learning from what the year before has taught them. And every single year, we should, as an educational institution, be learning something and tweaking it. So it's like plants. A plant will be fine for a while and then if you keep using the same soil year after year after year, those plants are going to die. Absolutely. Not because there's anything wrong with the plant, but because the soil is no longer right for it. Absolutely. So you, you, you make those changes. And as we get new teachers coming into our system, which is another thing, you know, gone are the days where teachers hang around for 20 years. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't happen anymore, right? Parents How and... How of your staff who are, have been here for a long time are, are, are watching you? Because <laughs> if so, you're getting a paper tomorrow. <laughs> Um, but we, we, we so, so that change is good. And I, I, my advice to parents and to children, don't be worried when somebody, yes, of course, you're going to miss them as a human being, right? But as long as you trust the school to bring in another good teacher, with that new teacher comes new ideas, new ways of doing things. They're not set in a particular way. So I, I love to have that mix, making sure that I have the experienced teachers that are there, but always having new teachers coming in that we can learn from in terms of, you know, what they've learned. They've just come out of university. Some of us haven't been to university for 20 years. Some of us longer. <laughs> so another question that's come through is, could you give some of the places, some of the universities that last year's IB students went to? You've mentioned a University of Pennsylvania. Sure. So uh, we've got University of Pennsylvania, University of Illinois, University of Houston, Concordia University in Canada, University of Exeter, King's College London, and then locally UCT, University of Pretoria, Wits, and some, and one student going to AFTA. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a big range, and these are yeah. well-known schools absolutely. as well. Yeah, absolutely. Across, everyone recognizes these names. Yeah. So over COVID, moving now onto online schooling, sure. our kids sit online. And some kids absolutely thrived on online. But most kids, when it got back to the options to go back to school, most of the children grabbed it with both hands. Absolutely. Now, as a parent at the school, full disclosure, I thought your online offering was absolutely fantastic. But I was relieved when my children came back to school. What's happened, though, is those children who did well on online, and some children actually did better online than they were doing in mm -hmm. school itself, mm -hmm. maybe fewer distractions, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And they decided to go on and do different online programs. Mm -hmm. So the Cambridge system, et cetera. When you hear the words Cambridge, even though it's not Cambridge University, you think sure. to yourself, well, maybe that's a maybe that's a better way to go. Mm. If my child's happier online, mm. what would you say to a parent who was looking at those options? It's a confusing thing. Mm. So, so just to put it out there, I'm not a fan of online learning, mm. right? Do I think there's a place for certain kids? I do think there's a place for certain kids. Um, but I, I think what the world has taught us is that we have to move into what I what we call blended learning, mm. right? Because there is a place. What our, what our students have learned, and I've seen it because of COVID, is can I stay at home today because I'm in my comfort zone? Sure. Uh, but when we talk about comfort zone, it's 
I've got my chair there, I've got my desk there, I've got my cup of coffee there. Yeah. Can I just get online and can I just talk to you? Now, while it's really important for our kids to be at school, and I think all kids should be at school, mm -hmm. because even if your kid doesn't like socializing, sure. you know, I've got some news for you. You're going to have to go into the big world out there and you're going to have to socialize unless you're going to just sit in a room all day and just work there. So children, in the same way as certain children don't like doing maths or science or, or don't like studying, well, you have to go and you have to do it. Children have to be sometimes pushed into socialising. Right? It's like tax. No one wants to pay it, but we all have but, to. But you have to pay it. Absolutely. Um, and I think most students don't don't come to school to, to they don't come to school to learn. No. They come to school to socialise. Right. They want to play rugby. They want to swim. They want to be in the play. I mean, I don't remember most of my teachers or my, my schooling, mm -hmm. but I remember being on the theatre and the theatre on stage. I remember swimming. You know, those, I remember going on tours. That's I remember going on camps. These are the, the friendships mm -hmm. that you're forming. And I think on. I'm going to be slated for this, but hey, I'm used to it. Um, in, in a way, I think every time Dick and Harry's opening up an online school because it's easy money at the moment, mm. right? Well, that is something that's come through is it is much cheaper. It absolutely is. And and you don't have to, you know, you don't, but, you know, but if you, if you, if you actually look at most of the product out yeah. there, it's a teacher talking to children mm. over a screen. Mm. So when we talk about the money aspect, I think that's a different aspect, and I'd like to get onto that. Mm. But for, 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 for parents who feel that whether it's a government school or a private school, that they're happy with that school, I would say you need to be at school. However, blended learning has to become part of our reality. There has to be a time where your child can be at home, and can have the comfort of being at home and know on that particular day they're not having to get in a car at 6 30 in the morning be at school do whatever they need to do and can have the time of comfort mm. in the same way as radial has always said that we're not preparing kids just to write an exam we're preparing them for the real world now if the real world is going blended yeah. where one or two days i can go into work and one or two days i can stay at home we've got to do that mm. i can't do it yet because i could have a strike <laughs> Not with my students. Your with teachers? My staff. They did brilliantly right. last year. They How did they didn't all rip their hair, I, I don't know. But blended learning is more difficult yes. than online learning. Of course. Online learning, I've got everybody there and the whole class is there. Blended learning, I've got some kids in my mm -hmm. class and some online. And it's really difficult to have to deal with those kind mm -hmm. of things. I think that progressive schools are in the next year or two going to be doing a lot of talking about how we can have children at times and I'm not talking about grade two, three, four, five. Sure, absolutely. Those kids must all be at school. Yeah. They must be playing, doing sport, yeah. having a good time. But as students are preparing for university, and universities are going to be blended. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about that. Well, if they're not um, already. If We've they're seen not that already. in the last two years from necessity, but now also from convenience. But we go back to the whole thing that before COVID, if you would have mentioned, mm -hmm. right, blended learning, online learning, teachers, sorry, teachers, most teachers, okay, would have just shut down, not doing this. Too difficult, can't be done. COVID pushed them into it. Best we learn that the real world out there is going to push us into blended learning because people are going to be asking for that. And if we don't actually start adapting the way we do it, slowly at first, learning, building, but if we get it right, I think that our senior school campuses are going to reflect university campuses. Well, what I think is also so interesting is traditionally, it's hard to pay teachers what they're worth because it's different. Obviously, in a private school setting, you're paying for the best. But there are other teachers where the salaries are so low, you just have to take what you can get. But with online learning, the worth is going to be in the teacher who can keep a class engaged that they can't have in the same room. Sure. And I saw it, in fact, with one of the teachers here, and I'm not going to mention names because then you'll work out who the child is. But there was one particular class that I was in the bedroom for as my daughter was going through it in grade nine. And they were doing the roll call. And of course, all these children turned their computers off because they're wearing their pajamas and making tea. Mm -hmm. And the teacher said, camera's on. And then he called on one of the boys and said, where are you? I can see the cameras on, where are you? And I can't see this, I can just hear it. I'm in the drive through sir. <laughs> So instead of losing his temper, which I would have done, yeah. so what are you getting? <laughs> My mom's giving me breakfast, sir. There was a little chat in the back. And he says, would you like us to drop some at the school for you, sir? <laughs> and 
prior to COVID, that would have been the kind of thing that would send anyone off the wall. That would have been a full lecture in front of the class and humiliated. He said, no, thank you. Thank you, mother, for being so good to her. Appreciate your mother. Make sure you've got your book ready. You've got 15 minutes to get home. Sure. And it just, the class was on side. And from there on, everyone was interacting. Mm -hmm. And that was very powerful for me to see because I thought for the first time, this doesn't just have to be when our children are trapped at home. Absolutely. So I think those teachers are going to become worth their weight in gold. There's Afterwards, no, I'll give you the name so you can give them an increased answer. Oh, <laughs> but I, I do think, uh, so, you know, just going back to that question of the affordability, yeah. right? Um, I think that is when, if, they, if, if, if you, there are no other alternatives, mm. then a good line, a good online university that you can afford yeah. is better than being at a bad school. Right, and that's when you have to weigh up. It's a very difficult decision. I would love to be in a situation to say that in South Africa, all of our schools are good and you're getting a great education. Sure. But unfortunately, I think where online schools do come to the fore mm. is when your child is going to a badly resourced school, a school where unfortunately, for whatever reason, it's not functioning and you can pay the 2,000 or the 1,000 Rand a month and get good teachers and be online, Sometimes you have to make that very difficult decision in terms of what is for the best for my child. Yeah. And then, but then make sure that you send your child to a club to be able to play sport outside because you can't take away the social interaction and online gaming mm -hmm. is not the answer to that because online gaming just allows the child to become more of a recluse. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm not saying that online gaming doesn't have certain advantages it in terms of thinking, only... but it can't be from computer to computer to computer. Online gaming is not a way out. You've got to then get your child playing tennis, mm. swimming, going to ballroom dancing, whatever it takes. And that becomes, you know, it's, it's an, you know, the parent has to be part of that to say, OK, we're going to do the online learning because I think you're going to get a better education. But on condition that you do go to this, that, or whatever it is. So that comes back to communication as well. And those questions, those conversations between parents and students are so important. I think some parents, even now, have that don't bother the doctor thing that our parents had. So they could be dying, but they would never phone the doctor because you don't bother the actual doctor until you're in hospital. And even sure. then, only the next morning. Yeah. And I think there are still some parents who are intimidated. No matter what standard of education or price of education they're paying, they're frightened to phone the teacher and say, listen, I'm really not sure. She's doing her online stuff, but I'm noticing this is happening, but I don't want to make a fuss, but what can the school help me with, but, but, but. And how does a parent get over that, that don't bother the doctor approach when it comes to educators, heads of school, teachers, guidance counselors? Mm -hmm. You know, it is a difficult one, mm -hmm. but I think at the end of the day, you've got to go back to saying, this is my child. Right. You know, I did a lecture the other day where I kind of said, I called it the good doctor. So I'm enamored by the good doctor. Right. I, I absolutely it's love beautiful. it. Um, I don't know if it's just, you know, the whole idea of someone being different and being accepted and having to struggle through, but still being able to reach where they can reach. To, and and I, I really find that interesting. Mm -hmm. But I also look at the good doctor and I say that if we could all become good doctors, what does a good doctor have to do? A good doctor has to have a good bedside manner or actually learn to do that. A good doctor has to be able to analyze what a problem is, but then they've got to be able to fix that problem. Yeah. You don't just say, well, this is the you know diagnosis and now find somebody to fix it for you. Teachers have to learn that part of their job is also, where is their problem? Mm. How do I fix it? Not somebody else, because that's part of my job. And how do I actually make myself accessible? The most beloved teachers, the teachers that people will remember are the teachers that go out of their way to help the child, right? I would like to think that that is why teachers do what they do, okay? Unfortunately, in South Africa, because the easiest course to get into is teaching, we have a lot of teachers who don't really want to be teachers. It's not also a calling. aren't trained in that specific. Ab absolutely. Because every teacher is a guidance counselor, whether they're trained as it or not. Ab absolutely. So parents need to actually be able to say that. I I've put my child this is my most precious possession mm. in your hands, right? I'm going to be part of this. Parents, 
there's a way of doing it. I was about to say that I think you're opening a de de terrible can of worms unless you unless you temper that. Absolutely. Okay, so here's the here's right. the yeah. If you as a parent want to get the best out of a teacher, teach uh, treat that teacher with res the respect they deserve. 100%. They don't work for you. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, when I hear this, but I pay your salary. No, you actually don't pay the salary. The school pays the salary. You pay for a whole lot of things that we give you, like swimming pools and tennis courts and everything else. Okay. Um, I, I, I get really angry. So somebody starts, I pay your salary. Stop paying my salary. Down as well. Go yeah. somewhere else and don't pay my salary. If it starts with, I really would like to discuss my child with you, right? I've got a problem. I'd like your advice. How can we work together? I think that you'll get a completely different response. Sure, sure. But some parents just, they just demand that things happen. But you know, I often think, I think that that often happens when they've held back for so long, it's become this massive crisis and then a small thing will happen and then there's a giant blow. Yeah. Whereas if these Can conversations happen? had started earlier, mm. that would never have come right. to pass. So, so good school, uh, again, goes back to resourcing. So, so, so many schools are so under-resourced, they don't have the people. Where the staff are so overworked mm. that they are exhausted, right? Um, and uh, that is a really difficult situation to deal with. And government needs to be dealing with these situations, right? I, you know, I don't, I don't know how they deal with it. They, they've really got to concern themselves with because education is what is going to make or break this country 100%. at the end of the day. But in schools, and both government and private schools, there are many government schools that are very well resourced and do have the people. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to go through the process. But I, I don't think any parent should be worried or scared to be able to bring an issue to a teacher's um, attention. And if that teacher deals with it in a bad way, you need to escalate it to the next person. And if you have to go all the way to the head, well, then that's what you have to do. So the question here, and I'm going to read it verbatim because I think it's so powerful. I'm so torn when it comes to the future of this country. Part of me wants my child to be rooted in South Africa and become part of the solution. What another part of me wonders if I'm sticking my head in the sand. How do we prepare our children for any eventuality when we as a family are uncertain? about whether South Africa has a future for our children and our children's children. Right, so nobody can make the ultimate decision in terms of what one has to do. Mm -hmm. What one has to do, as long as one is here, is future-proof your child. That whether you stay here or whether you go to another country, mm -hmm. the education that you give your child will equip your child to make it wherever they mm -hmm. go. Because that's the best that a parent can do. Decisions will come and decisions will go. Um, we could be staying in the country and who knows what happens next week. We, 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 we can't. And the one area that I don't believe in South Africa today you can kind of take lightly is your child's education. Sure. And again, I think parents need to do their homework. Mm -hmm. Which is the school that's going to give my child a good academic background, give them the skills that they require, the personal skills. Mm -hmm. It's not just the academic skills, um, the leadership skills, confidence you know, we work with words like courage, all right? How do you give that child courage that wherever, that if they have to leave, they can go? Curiosity, how do we build curiosity in a child? Because a child who's curious, no matter yeah. where they go, will be looking Don't for worry. answers, they'll be able to do that. And I think together, I really do believe that families and schools have to work in partnership. Um, again, I would say, when you have these ideas of wanting to move, or if you're thinking of semigrating or immigrating, let your school know. Work with your school on this because at the end of the day, you know, um, children are vulnerable. Um, they want to they want to feel that they're secure. They want to ensure that they're protected. Mm. And together we have to do that. But if we do it correctly, whether a child stays in the country, mm. goes to Cape Town, goes to Johannesburg, moves around, goes overseas, if they've got a solid foundation mm. behind them, they'll succeed wherever they go. So we only have five minutes left before we wrap. Is there anything we haven't covered tonight that you think it's important for parents to know? If you could leave them with one message this evening, what would it be? Don't rely on the school to do everything for you, okay. right? That really is important. Mm -hmm. um, I often say to parents, you know, when you're looking for a university, when you're looking for a course, when you're looking at subject choices, mm -hmm. um, you know, get involved, right? During the holidays, sit down with your child. Your child needs you as much. You, you can't abrogate responsibility to a school. A school is looking after 1,200, 1,400 children. We do the best that we can. But nobody actually knows your child as well as you know your child, right? Talk to your child. 
allow your child to feel they're part of a conversation and they're, they're not being spoken to all the time. Because when you, nine out of 10 times, a teenager is just going to do the opposite, right? If they feel that you're telling them what to do. Invite your child to a conversation. Let them understand that this is not your wishes and it's not about you, right? It's about them. And you want them to be involved in a conversation about their future. And when they tell you something that you kind of in horror look at because you want your child to be a doctor, yeah. but they want to be a film director, right? Don't show that. Say, let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. Why do you want to be a film director? What are the opportunities in film? Perhaps you'd like to do film and maybe do another course that will just give you a bit of a background. Um, these are important conversations, but most importantly, don't kind of say that's not happening. And unfortunately, I don't think parents do it because they want to be cruel to their child. They have such aspirations for their children to be certain things. Mm -hmm. Keep that to yourself. Talk to your child. Mm -hmm. Allow your child to talk and then pick up on the strings and the areas that they're interested in and work with them on those kind of things. I think any child that feels like they're part of a conversation, it's the same type of thing why, you know, we don't have punishment at our school, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Often people come and say, what's your demerit system? Mm -hmm. I say, I have, no, I have no idea. What we try and do is bring a child in and talk to the child, right? Talking to a teenager uh, specifically gets results. And I think if parents do that, so one, don't abrogate responsibility, be part of your child's life, listen to your child and the decisions that have to be made, uh, and let your school know what some of your plans are. And with those things together, you know, I think we can give um, everybody's child the best grounding to ensure that they are successful, whether they stay in South Africa or they go overseas. I know for me, the best advice I give is always to say, whatever you're telling your child about themselves, you have to be authentic and tell yourself the same thing. So if you're telling your child not to panic, you can't panic in front of them. Sure. And if you're telling your child that everything's going to be okay, if they work hard, they'll definitely get a great degree. And then you're the one panicking that that's not going to happen. Sure. It breaks trust with them. Sure. Sam, just on that, just before we end, because I mean, I, you know, I'm not bringing this as a punt. But I mean, I, mean, I, mean, I know you're a life coach. Sometimes, you know, you don't have to go see a psychologist. Sometimes, you know, somebody that is outside of the family circle, right, can be a very good sounding board, right, to be able to go and see. So when you're having those kind of issues and those struggles, you know, talk to as many people as you can. 100%. You know, if it's a family friend, if it's a school, if it's a life coach, mm -hmm. right, to be able to give you perspective. Yeah. Um, that sometimes is really, really important. So important. I do think parents can find different ways of having those conversations. And there's nothing wrong with asking for some help. Thank you very much. Can't wait to see what our next topic is going to be. I've, I've really enjoyed this. And specifically... I'm saying it was such a surprise. <laughs> no, no, I think it, it's, it's allowed us the, the, the ability to have a proper conversation. Yeah. You know, often I get asked to speak on, on, a, on, a, on a radio station mm -hmm. or a television and they give you one minute mm -hmm. to tell them all about everything that you think. And, sorry, it's not going to happen. So this has been amazing. And, I and think, this will be permanently available. Anyone can download this or watch this. So, so whatever you didn't get or if you had to move off and, and have some coffee or some tea or you had to go make dinner or do someone's homework, We'll do your own homework. It's still be available. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being Thank with you. me. I really enjoyed it. That's fantastic. Excellent. Okay.